I'm going to stand up. <laughs> All right. Um, can everybody hear me OK? Good. All right, so as our uh, wonderful volunteer mentioned, um, our talk will be about making your privacy software usable. So as a great TED Talk once told me, you should always start with why. So the reason we're here today is that we believe if somebody cares about privacy, they should have access to privacy software. And not only should they have access, but they should be able to successfully use privacy software regardless of their background. So there are a few uh, projects that would probably agree with this statement. These projects care about user experience. They are Mailvelope, which does encrypted webmail, Tor, which does private browsing, and CryptoCat, which is a private chat system. And we'll be talking about these three projects throughout the presentation. Uh, traditionally, when you're talking about uh, online privacy projects, there's usually uh, introduced in some sort of security usability trade-off, where on one side you have security, and on the far side you have uh, usability. Uh, th this is really a false choice uh, when it comes down to most things in uh, terms of privacy projects, and it's really a, a justification for bad design or not really going the extra mile for user experience. Uh, one aspect, though, that uh, a similar uh, continuum does uh, does hold, though, is uh, in the area of uh, education to the users, where uh, on one side you have uh, security and on one side you have ignorance. Uh, this being uh, as a result of uh, bad user experience can actually be a feature when it comes to uh, education. So by the time that uh, users fight through all your bad user experience and get to being able to use the product, uh, then they probably uh, know how to use it properly because they actually understand the foundations of how the software is functioning. Uh, an example of this would uh, be in GBG, where uh, in its most basic form, uh, you're invoking it via a command line. Uh, now, just simply getting to the command line uh, shows that you have a level of technical proficiency that is not uh, average or representative of the general public. So you're already starting off at uh, narrowing the uh, audience that you can apply the software to and also uh, ensuring that uh, your user base is more technically efficient. Uh, and this is, this is probably a bad thing if you're looking to uh, reach mass audiences. But you just look at the need of learning GPG where you see this man page uh, below there. It's probably very pixelated on the screen. But um, uh, if you want to learn how to invoke a command for GPG on the command line, you hit uh, man GPG and you get this long uh, discussion of uh, all the commands you can run and what they do. And by the time that you distill all that text down to the uh, command you know you want and that's exactly correct, uh, you probably uh, have at that point been educated in the proper uh, use of the software. Um, the problem with this is people hate to read the manual. Uh, and you know, they won't ever use the software if uh, they have to go through this wall of text to, uh, to start using it. Uh, the solution to this is a uh, principle of user experience design process. Uh, and uh, this, these principles are particularly important for uh, privacy software because there's numerous examples of software that's been published in the world and then uh, promotion has gotten, uh, has taken a front seat to uh, actually delivering uh, usable privacy. So uh, an example four years ago was Haystack. They uh, were really trying to publish the software that would help the Iranian dissidents get a, around a lot of the censorship and uh, uh, activities of the Iranian government. Uh, they published a uh, early prototype of it, and uh, they wanted people to engage in testing of the software. However, in the course of promoting it and trying to get more open source contributors and uh, become a uh, uh, important and relevant project, they actually ended up uh, exposing some of the user base to uh, the Iranian government, and it became clear to uh, the government uh, who was actually using the software, and it exposed them to uh, potential uh, loss of uh, liberty or life. So when you're publishing uh, software in the privacy space, you have to publish responsibility. You're really uh, not building you know, the, the app of the day. Uh, you're not building another Flappy Bird. You're building a um, uh, essentially building a bridge. And the failure mode for this is a much greater responsibility than uh, your typical software. Um, 
Uh, so uh, remember when you're engaging in this user experience process and trying to make it as useful as possible that you have uh, an idea of uh, what the user will, uh, how the user will use the software in its natural environment and whether or not that is uh, leading to them compromising their expectation of privacy and using your software. So uh, we tried to change the world by applying these user experience principles to software. And the way we did that was holding a meetup called Techno Acti Activism Third Mondays. Now Techno Activism Third Mondays is a meetup that happens internationally. Uh, there are many meetups across the world that happen, as you might guess, every third Monday. And these meetups bring together software developers, artists, and coders to talk about issues related to privacy, security, surveillance, and censorship. So at our particular meetup, we introduced user experience principles and then broke people into groups and asked them to apply those principles to critique existing software. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll talk to you all about what I taught them and also um, what those attendees found in those pieces of privacy software. So we start at the beginning. What is user experience? Uh, the idea behind user experience is that we make the system match the user. So we try not to say, oh, we just need to train the user to learn better. We try instead to say, how can we change the system to better fit the user? We ask questions like, how should the user feel when they use the software? What should the user do? What should the user learn? And we achieve this through both design and research. So user experience is not only about creating a beautiful user interface, but it's also about conducting research to figure out what should you even create in the first place. And also, research can help you uncover problems related to your product. So we should note that user experience is everywhere, not just in software. So can somebody tell me what's wrong with these elevator buttons? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> they're both pointing up, which uh, you're not really sure what it's going to do. Maybe if you press the up one, it'll take you up faster. Um, <laughs> so this is an example of poor user experience in everyday life. Another example is this door that you may never, ever be able to get unlocked. And if you look on Pinterest and Tumblr, you'll find a bunch of examples related to user experience in the real world. And once you start looking, you will also find them everywhere. So an example related to software is this lovely drop-down menu that makes you choose a date from all the dates in all of the land. And so you, you, you're trying to choose a date, right? But this isn't normal. Like This isn't consistent with what users are used to. You're used to either typing in a date or choosing it from a calendar. And so that's what you would expect. Um, so as Sean mentioned, uh, th there's this assumption that you have to give up user experience to have a secure or private system. And we want to break down that assumption and start applying user experience principles to privacy software. So what is good user experience? Um, well, aside from emotion, which I will not be talking about very much in this talk, but it is a large part of user experience. So aside from that, it boils down to two questions. The first question is, does the user know how to do what they want to do? And that sounds very simple, right? The user has a task in mind, and they want to complete that task. Do they know the steps that they need to take in order to complete that? And this is called the gulf of execution. So how big is that gap in between knowing what they want to do and knowing how to do it in your system? So in our Techno Activism Third Monday meetup, they downloaded Mailvelope, which is a um, encrypted web mail system. So they knew that they wanted to send an encrypted email. But after they downloaded Mailvelope, they didn't know the next step to take, because you download Mailvelope, and then it's just kind of there, but there's no, really, there's no information that tells you what the next step is. And the problem here is that Mailvelope has documentation, but it's on the download page instead of within the application itself. So the way you could fix this as a developer is to actually include documentation within the app. So uh, the second question is, does the user know what they did worked? And this is called the gulf of evaluation. Um, so there should be something in the system that tells the user you completed your task and you did it correctly. So next. Um, 
our example is from the Tor browser. So the Tor browser has this great browser bundle that you can download and install. And our Techno Activism Third Monday attendees, they downloaded the Tor browser, and then they opened the Tor browser, and the splash screen came up with information. Um, but they didn't know if that was it. They didn't know if their task was done. They did not know if they had achieved private browsing at that point. So the way to fix that would possibly be to change the text on that splash page to make it more obvious, or to add something else in the system. So if you're a developer, you've seen, you've probably seen this. It works, and that's when you install Apache and everything is beautiful and runs great. And the reason we like that as users of that system is that it tells us that we did something right and that we're done now. Um, <laughs> and it's also very simple and very clear, and it's pretty much the only thing on the page when you load Apache. So that would be a way to kind of get around this issue of the gulf of evaluation. So those are two questions, the gulf of or evaluation and execution. Um, but there is more. As the talk description explains, we'll be talking about um, Nielsen's usability heuristics. So has anybody heard of these before? Great. All right, so uh, Nielsen is a famous user experience person. Yes, <laughs> Jacob Nielsen. And um, he came up with 10 usability heuristics that you can apply to pretty much any interface. Um, and these heuristics will not necessarily give you a grade. It won't be like you received a 90% on your software. Instead, they help you uncover problems related to your software. All right, so I'm going to go over four of them, not all 10. Um, and if all of you who know about Nielsen's usability heuristics want to interject and fix anything I say, you're welcome to. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is the visibility of system status. So this is the idea that the system should always keep users informed about what's going on through appropriate feedback within reasonable time. And a very simple example of this is a loading bar. So when you have something that's loading on your computer, it will tell you how much of it has been loaded either through that, you know, this filling the blue bar or the percentage there. Um, and that tells you that the system is doing something even if it looks like it's not doing anything. It makes us feel good. So an example of this with um, the Technoactives and Third Mondays uh, related to the Tor browser again was that after they installed the Tor browser, the users weren't sure what state the system was in. They didn't know if that private browsing was like turned on or not. And so you could fix this by simply telling the user, yes, it's turned on um, in some sort of way. So the second heuristic I'll go over is about consistency and standards. And this is the idea that you don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's fun to reinvent the wheel, sometimes the wheel is broken, but a lot of times you just want to do what the user expects. So users should not have to wonder whether different words, situations, or actions mean the same thing, and you should follow platform conventions. A really good example of this is in the OSX operating system. Every single application has a menu bar across the top, and all of those menu bars are pretty similar. So we expect that as users to see that menu bar. Now, in relation to our privacy software, we found that um, with CryptoCat, everything on this screen is blue. And you might say, oh, that's, that's consistent. Everything's blue. Um, <laughs> but that's actually monochromatic, and that's a talk for another time. So this is an example of not following platform conventions because this is a text box that's blue. This is a label that's blue. This is a button that's blue. So a way that you could fix this to change it to something that the user would expect would be to change this text box to have a white background, to remove the background on the label, and probably keep the button as the same color. So these are simple changes and fixes that will make your system easier to use for um, your audience. All right, third, I think we're on three. Um, <laughs> the third heuristic that I'll talk about is recognition over recall. And this is the idea that you want to minimize the user's load by making objects, actions, and options visible. So the user shouldn't have to remember information. And now, as a lot of us are developers, we might say, well, we love the command line. It's so great. It does everything I want. But the command line is actually a really bad example, and it is an example of something that violates this heuristic because you have to remember all of the commands. Um, so instead, an example would be 
relying on recognition instead, where you can see all of the fonts, for example, that you want to choose instead of having to remember the name of the font. And in most software, you can do both. You can either type in the font or choose it from a list. And that helps satisfy both very exper experienced users and those who want to explore a little bit with these fonts. Um, so as we mentioned earlier with GPG, as a command line tool, it would violate this heuristic. However, with Tor, CryptoCat, and Mailvelope, they did a really good job adhering to this heuristic, so we didn't find any issues in our group with this particular one. So the last heuristic I'll talk about is about help and documentation. Um, so this is a cartoon that was shown to me as an undergraduate. There are actually many panes in this cartoon about how software is developed. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you do, projectcartoon.com. Um, <laughs> and this is a picture of how the project was documented, and it's empty. So a lot of projects don't have documentation or don't have adequate documentation. And it's not only important that a product has documentation, but also that it is findable, searchable, and relevant to the user. So in the example of Mailvelope, next, um, like I mentioned earlier, there was documentation, but the user couldn't find it within the system. So the way to fix that, like I mentioned, was to put the documentation within the app itself instead of making the user search for something elsewhere. Uh, anything else? Oh, and um, help and documentation is very important for privacy software for reasons that Sean will explain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> going back to that um, security ignorance side, uh, while the everyday user is not likely to go through and read the manual, uh, someone who is using it for more um, more intense use cases, like uh, trying to get around uh, the reigning government in that earlier example, uh, it's going to become uh, obvious that they should actually read all the documentation and learn everything about it, because uh, uh, the, the threat model, uh, so to speak, that they're trying to deal with is so much more intense than the everyday users, uh, where the everyday user might uh, uh, just be concerned with the uh, passive uh, collection of their information, not the active targeting of them as an individual. Yeah, so it's important to have that help and documentation for users. Um, because like Sean said, if users are uh, you know, risking their life by using this software, they should, they should be able to understand how it works. All right. So we've just learned a ton of stuff, actually. Things that are taught in graduate level usability courses. Uh, we've learned about the gulf of execution. Does the user know how to do what they want to do? We've learned about the gulf of evaluation. Does the user know that what they did worked? And we learned about four different um, Nielsen's usability heuristics. So not only do we have these tools, but I'm going to teach you one more. <laughs> and this tool, so the tools I've talked about um, prior are ones that you can do by yourself, that you can do as a developer or as a user to critique software, to keep in mind while you're creating software. So what we're going to teach you now is how to actually run a think aloud study. And this is a method that you need two people for. You need one person to be the researcher. You need one person to be the user. And this Think Aloud study, like the name suggests, is where you watch somebody use your software and ask them to talk you through the process. So we're going to show you how to do it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be the researcher, and Sean is going to be the user. And the idea is, I'm going to sit down now because you don't want to hover over your users. Um, <laughs> also, the World Cup is going on right now. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to bring up just a notepad taking tool so I can take notes while Sean is talking while using the software. And I should note also, if you get the user's consent, you can also do things like capture the screen or um, attach a webcam or videotape Sean if you want to look at this data later. So let me open a notepad document. And now I'm going to ask Sean. Sean, could you please uh, send a private message with CryptoCat and talk aloud while you're trying to do that task? Oh, and CryptoCat's already on the computer? Yes, CryptoCat is already on the computer. And I'll be typing notes, and then we'll talk about the issues as they um, afterwards. <laughs> so. 
So can you tell me what you're looking for? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking for where CryptoCat is, like how to find CryptoCat. Uh, so maybe if I type it in here. Okay, uh, these are a bunch of web pages. I was hoping that that address bar would just take me to it. So it's already installed. I know I don't want to download it, but um, uh, but it does look like it runs on Chrome. So it's probably here somewhere. Oh, there's this apps button. Uh, oh, there's CryptoCat. It's right next to the uh, blocking geese. Uh, all right, so now now I'm in CryptoCat. Uh, private conversations for everyone. Uh, I know it's a chat program. I don't really know what's different about uh, CryptoCat from GChat. I usually don't talk to a bunch of people on GChat at once. So I'm pretty sure that's already private. Um, it's not a magic bullet for something. Uh, let's see. Let's try and start the chat now. So group chat, I think that's right. I don't really want to go to Facebook for any reason. Uh, conversation name. Enter a name for your conversation and share it with people you'd like to talk to or join lobby to meet new people. I think I'd like to meet new people. So I think I type that here. All right, well, there's my username already. I'm not sure how that got there, but okay. Uh, enter a name of a conversation to join. Okay, can't click there. Um, it's a little weird, but let's see if it works. All right, generating new generating encryption keys. Here's an interesting fact for you: cats have an a, the AB blood type, which is also found in humans. All right, would have been a little good to find out what generating keys meant, uh, but that was pretty entertaining. Um, now I am in a chat room. I think there's several people named uh, Star Fox, Cassidy. Uh, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have used my uh, uh, my S. McGregor username. I'm with all these people. Now they kind of know who I am and using this software, uh, or at least these people do. Uh, so let me change my username. Um, okay, reject, log out. Oh, okay, I could probably change it if I logged out. Uh, I'm good for now, though. So I'll just keep going. Um, and yeah, but this is a group room. I, I just want to talk to a particular person, a single person. Uh, Star Fox. Am I now talking to that person? If I type in here, who am I talking to? Is this a direct message? I can ignore the person. <laughs> but am I talking to that person? Okay, let me go back to the lobby. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt <laughs> now. So that's an example of Think Aloud, and Sean was being a model user. He talked a lot, which was great. I could tell what he was thinking and what he was trying to do. Um, so a lot of times the hardest part about Think Aloud is getting your user to talk. Um, and a way to get around that is giving them a practice task to do. One example of a practice task is explain to me how many windows are in your house. And that will allow them to get used to talking out loud. And then you give them the actual task of doing whatever you want them to do. So I've been taking notes throughout this. So I found that Sean had a hard time um, finding CryptoCat, which might not be something that CryptoCat can necessarily fix unless they change how their app is distributed. Um, and then when Sean found CryptoCat, he had the question, how is this different from other chats? Um, and he also tried clicking on that label. So like I mentioned, you might want to remove that background on the label because it looks, makes it look like it's clickable. Um, and then in the, another issue was you know, when that loading screen was coming up about encryption, there was a fun fact about cats. But Sean, as a user who really cares about his privacy, is wondering, well, what are they encrypting keys for? Like, <laughs> I'd rather know that instead of a fun fact about cats. Um, I'd, I'd like to know both. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so, and then he was wondering how do you message a specific person and how do you do that and was not able to find how to do that. So that's related to that gulf of execution, knowing what you want to do but not knowing exactly how to do it. Um, so those are issues that we kind of uncovered, but not only would you want to take notes, but you want to ask Sean a few questions after it. So you would ask Sean about how satisfied he is with the system, what issues that he found, 
what he would improve if he were creating the system, um, what, what did he like about the system? So you want to ask these questions to also get some qualitative data for you to be able to understand what to fix. Um, but this think aloud uh, method is very useful. As you saw, it took two minutes for us to uncover five problems, and it's uh, really lightweight. So if you have somebody around you who you can do this with, it's, it's very useful. Now, one objection that some people talk about related to user experience testing is, well, if I do it with Sean, then I'm only going to make software that works for Sean, and I'm not going to be able to make software that works for everybody. And the fact of the matter is, if you don't involve Sean, you're going to make software that works for exactly you. So at least now, it'll work for you and Sean. <laughs> and that's better than working for nobody. So involving people in your design process is a good idea um, and will help you uncover some issues. So I'm going to stand up again. Um, <laughs> so now we've talked about the Think Aloud protocol, and we've talked about all of these other heuristics. So you're practically you experts favorite slide. Um, <laughs> so with this knowledge, what can you do now? You can start or attend a TA3M in your city. Um, Techno Activism Third Mondays can be started by anybody and attended by anybody. Um, and they're a really great way to get in contact with folks who care about issues related to privacy um, and security, etc. And also you could pitch doing one of these UX sprints in your uh, group or in your meetup. You could also go it alone. Now, I know the keynote said it's dangerous to go alone, but in this case, you can start doing stuff all by yourself with these tools that we've given you related to heuristics. And once you find some issues, I encourage you all to engage with privacy projects. A lot of these projects care about user experience, and a lot of them are open source, so we'll take your feedback. Um, so I encourage you to join a mailing list, post something to that mailing list, start a conversation about these things if you find any issues. And finally, you can include user experience in your napkin ideas. So from the very initial point of you having an idea for some amazing privacy software that you think will change the world, you can start writing, um, you can keep, I guess, those heuristics in the back of your mind while you're creating these ideas. And that will set you on the path to create software that is usable, that people can successfully use regardless of their background. Uh, and that's it for the... Uh formal portion of the presentation, and uh, we can take questions and uh, open up for discussion at this point. And the link to the uh, thing is there. It's pretty long, but readable. <laughs>